back here with a friend of the channel, second time hanging out, Carlos Ferro. How you doing, bud? Really good, brother. Thanks for uh, interviewing me again. It's becoming like, you know, brotherhood here. We're, we, we're very close, <laughs> and uh, but it's a pleasure to be back. With Literally. You. Literally. But uh, uh, it makes me happy. You were saying, you, you, I mean, the way we spoke last time, you love the RGV. I think you came a day early. Like, did you, have you been I, having a good time so far? Yeah, I came a day early because I wanted to make sure the show was successful, at least do my part. So I was on uh, 104. Uh, uh, I was on the radio talking about the Valley. And uh, I don't know, it, it felt really good to, like, reach out, tell people there's a geek party this weekend. I'll be at it. Come to it. You know, so it was fun. It was a really fun thing. So I looked you up. You wrote and uh, produced uh, Sal oh and, it, and it won a Bay Area Critics Award. Yeah, man, that is that is a deep, deep cut. That is a deep. That's the research <laughs> yeah, that the research department is really good. Um, DNC, right? DNC Digital. DNC Digital's research department should get a raise on that one because he's talking about a show that I did that arguably created all of this happened because of that show over 20 years ago i did a one-man show yeah yeah i'm that bitch um i can you hear this with sound are you all right i hope so no we're good go ahead we're good with sound okay so sal's a play about sal minio who was an actor that was famously murdered in the 70s but he was in rebel without a cause with james dean and he was the like he was 16 and he got best supporting actor nominations uh, uh like he's been he was nominated for oscars a couple times emmys and i uh i wanted to tell the story but i was a young actor um like really really new dude like i i think i'd only had my first couple of tv show that were like t local shows in san francisco they were network shows and so i do this showcase piece in los angeles that like i said it changed my life it created everything everything started popping after I forced audiences to listen to me talk for an hour, you know, and it was, it was amazing because it was all my, it was my baby. Like, you know, you would know, you know, creators would know once you put not just your heart and soul, but your money <laughs> into things, it means something when it succeeds, when it has some sort of good result. And uh, I'm very proud of it. So Sal, uh, when you guys are bored, uh, yeah, look up my name with Sal Minio and you'll get some trivia, some reviews that I'm really proud of. That's a very interesting story. What about that story made you want to do a show on that? It started really simply and kind of superficially about the resemblance. When I, 20 years ago, I looked a lot like the guy. And this and this guy was, um, you know, he's Italian from New Jersey. And he, we had so many things in common in terms of like background and in terms of just looks. I mean, really, he was he was a guy with a pompadour just like me. And he, he was playing different kind of, uh, when it was not an odd thing to play different races, he had a lot of range. Like, you know, for theater geeks, he was on Broadway, went into television when it was a fairly new thing. And by the time he was in features with huge movie stars, he started kind of upstaging them. And for a young actor, I was kind of like in that zone of a young actor where you're hungry. And I'm like, I want to be that dude. You felt a parallel. Absolutely. I want to be that dude. And then when he gets murdered, the tragedy is like, that's a story you want to tell. Because the rumor mill about old movie stars and murders and things, the, the legend is always bigger than the reality. And the reality is what I wanted to tell. And so uh, doing it in Hollywood, it was really rewarding because I had people that knew him. And like movie stars show up. I got sued by a really famous movie star. Oh, that's fun. Uh, it's really fun, but it didn't work because I had like, I, I had also a legal team looking after my shit, but I, um, I curse a lot, um, for you DNC people that know. <laughs> okay. um, so I, uh, I had this really transformative experience, you know, that started out with like, I look like that guy to like, I want to tell his story. And I had full cooperation from the family and from everybody that I mentioned. But I was also talking about issues about blacklisting, sexuality and things that were very 70s and uh, more relevant than ever by the time I was doing this in the mid 90s. So yeah, mid 90s, because I'm that fucking old. Anyway, so now now it's a trip to look back because it uh, none of the uh, none of those themes or any of those things have gone away. Like I right now, everyone's talking about representation, about, you know, opportunity. And uh, that's what I was bitching about 20 years ago. Uh, speaking of looking back, um, late 80s, early 90s. How's DJ? He had to say late 80s. He had, he had when I say that. late 80s, it was like December was, of 1989. It wasn't. No, I know. I know. But um. When we talk about the evolution of hip hop, you and I have had hours and hours of conversation on, on hip hop. Um, what do you feel about the way it's changed? Because everybody, I want to say that everybody says it wasn't like it was back then. They say that about movies. They say that yeah. about video games and music. How do you feel hip hop is at a state right now? I'm not, I'm not a big fan 
of dismissing people's hard work and especially creative people and artists. It's it's a, it's a it's a shitty enterprise to be in to slam or bag on people that are trying to be creative. Um, I don't I don't mess with people's hustle. You know what I mean. So that 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 being said. I still am passionate about music. I always have been, being a DJ that paid my way through school. And we've, we've talked about dance music and the evolution of it. But when it comes to hip hop, what I think people are, are uh, mistaking, uh, this is just my opinion, I think people are mistaking nostalgia for their, their feelings of nostalgia for quality and for you know uh, how how good something is. I think it's that your, your fondness for something that you were grooving to in high school and in college it will affect your these new young kids and what they're doing. And that's a very strange zone. Like I said, I don't slam people's hustles. I focus on the positive and not to get too touchy-feely and dreamy about it. I really do try to stick with positivity. We got plenty of people talking shit about other people's work. For me, it's like, for everything that seems kind of like that's not my jam, there's a Kendrick Lamar that's, you know, is, is amazing. And, and for every, you know, singer that's auto-tuned to hell and back, there's people that are doing incredible things with auto-tune. And like that's become a new standard and something, another tool to create and to make music. So, yeah, as much as I love and I mean love albums like Omatic and Nas and I can tell I can tell stories about Dre and you know all the way back to the world class wrecking crew and it was like party music to when literally gangster rap was created and that evolution it doesn't make me frown upon Bruno Mars or anybody that you know hires you know Snoop to do a few bars in a dance song I, I'm into it I'm like let's let's create stuff let's keep let's keep all of this legacy alive rather than saying um, you know these kids today don't know what they're doing it's like I mentioned last time DJing as long as it sounds good I'm happy that, that's that's the key it has to move me in some way even if it's just on the dance floor a little bit as a DJ did it did uh did, did you find it difficult maybe to adapt to the change in music throughout the years Beats per minute never goes away, man. You, you're a DJ. It's it's if you if you can, you know, beat match or you can, you know, hit the sync button and keep people moving and keep people happy and dancing. It's all it's all good. A new dance crowd, though. It is, but it isn't. Like I, I had a um, perfect example. I was playing uh, trance, uh, which is not crazy, you know, fast. It's just it's it's a reasonable beats per minute. But the guy that was opening for me at a gig was playing the most. Like I mean, it seemed like two hundred beats per minute. I mean, it was so fast and loud, and it was more in what people think now of when they think of. Um, you know, Skrillex and uh, uh, dubstep, you okay. know? And so it was very dubstepy, but even more aggressive and like kind of hardcore oh, for lack of a better term. And the place was loving. And I thought, man, I'm going to show up and kind of bum everybody out. And they welcomed it. And so I kind of welcomed it because I was like hearing stuff I, I didn't hear before. I was, it, it didn't seem like boring. And that's kind of, I think I've said that two, two interviews back. I think I said, you can do anything with art. Just don't bore me. Don't bore me. And uh, music, and art in general, you know, it's, it's it's rarely boring. One more time, where can they find you on social media? Real Carlos Ferro on Twitter, Real Carlos Ferro on Instagram, and Facebook, Carlos Ferro. Dominic Santiago, Leonardo da Vinci, DJ Dom Father. Thank you so much for you all your always. time and your friendship, and it's it's always so cool to talk to you. Come to the Valley. It's where it's at.